Good morning, everybody online who's joining us. We're glad you could tune in today. So my wife and I were on a family vacation with another couple a few years ago, and I was going to keep their identity a secret because they were supposed to be here this morning. I didn't want to embarrass them, but then they got sick, so they couldn't make it. So it was my dad. It was my dad and my stepmom. We were on this trip with them. And uh, it was a long trip. We were driving from Illinois down to New Orleans, Louisiana. We are going to sail out of there and take a cruise. It was going to be a great time. And it's a big trip. It's a long time to be stuck in a car with another person or four people. And inevitably, what happened is what always happens when you're stuck in a car for 10 hours with somebody. My dad and my stepmom, they were sitting up front, and somebody, I won't say who, made a comment about the other person's driving. <laughs> and the person driving, he didn't take very kindly to that, so they made a comment back about how the other person just needed to be a passenger. And they didn't like that, so they reciprocated, and it kind of went back and forth, and the, the little jabs kind of got a little more intense, and my wife and I are in the back seat like, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's fine, we're going to be okay. And so like, they're kind of arguing a little bit, and then inevitably after that, it was just silent. And we all just sort of drove through that little automotive prison of tension together, right? <laughs> like... It's not a big deal, but it happens. It happens. I can share that story because I know most of us in here probably have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. If you've ever been in a vehicle for a long period of time, you've been in a very similar scenario. Every human relationship, whether it be a romantic or it be a friendship or it be a business partnership, whatever, every human relationship is inevitably going to experience turbulence. And sometimes that tension is minor and it works itself out, like in the case of my little road trip story, everything was fine. Other times, though, the turbulence and the tension are a little more intense and the hurt runs a little bit deeper and things do not automatically just sort of work themselves out. Bitterness takes root. Hurt spreads and intensifies. And sometimes forgiveness is something that we have to actually work towards. Sometimes we don't want to do that, though. Our culture, in fact, at times even encourages us to cut toxic people out of our lives. No, just leave them to the side. You go on. You do your own thing. You don't need to worry about reconciling or forgiving. But is that really what we're supposed to do? This is kind of the stuff we wrestle with on a daily basis to different degrees and, and varieties. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Matters of forgiveness, reconciliation, and, and do we even really need to do it? Jesus talks about this in the book of Matthew in chapter 5. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, why don't you turn there to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. That's where we're going to begin. This is part of a, a year and a half long study we're in called A Year-ish with Jesus. We're going through April of 2024. Today we're in Matthew 5. We've been here since uh, December, so you can see we're, we're going at a decently slow pace. But we're here today, and if you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen behind. You can open up the FCC Monmouth app, tap the... Uh, Bible, or the Bible study, the Sunday button uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. There's a sermon notes tool. It's got our passage, got the outline for the message, all that good stuff pulled up right there in one place for you to get the most out of. So our question, how do we forgive people? Like how do we actively do that? And do we even really need to worry about it? Those are the questions that we, we sometimes wrestle with. And both of those questions are answered in this kind of opening little section and in, in the examples that Jesus gives that follows. We look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Here's kind of how he gets things rolling. He says, You heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And we'll pause there for a minute. That first line, we've probably all heard that a time or two. We're familiar with it. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And a lot of times today we hear that in terms of like justifying revenge or like even mandating some sort of retaliation. You know, they, they did me dirty, so I'm going to get back at you, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the way it's supposed to be kind of thing. But these words didn't originate as a call to action. They actually originated in the Old Testament law. And it was God's way of sort of putting up a barricade or a barrier as to how far we can pursue restitution or how far we can pursue vindication. It was supposed to limit our actions and our retaliations. And this was a law that protected both victims as well as perpetrators. On the hand of the victim, uh, it made sure that people received justice, fitting justice, regardless of their situation or station in life. You know, we have a justice system in which things are supposed to be equal, but that really wasn't even the case in the ancient world. There was no uh, pretense of being equal. 
A good comparison, if you've ever heard of Hammurabi's Code or the Law of Hammurabi, that is a series of laws written by Hammurabi in a very similar time period and region of the world. And he also includes eye for eye, tooth for tooth in his code or in his law. The problem was not everybody's teeth were equally valuable and not everybody's eyes were equally valuable. If you were a slave, your teeth and your eyes weren't nearly as valuable as a noble's teeth and eyes. And if you were a woman, your teeth and eyes weren't nearly as valuable as a man's teeth and eyes. So, you know, if a slave lost their eye or their child was gored by an irresponsible noble's bull, like, he might get a small sum of money, here's a hundred bucks, justice is served, let's go on our way. But if you're that person who lost their child, that hundred bucks is nothing. That may be what the law called for, but... Something just doesn't seem right. And so this code that God puts in place, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is meant to protect the downtrodden and the vulnerable and those who weren't of high station in life to make sure victims got fitting justice. If somebody takes your tooth, well, they're going to lose a tooth. There's going to be restitution. If somebody takes something more valuable like your eye, rest assured, there will be fitting restitution and justice will be served. So it fit or protected victims. But it also protected perpetrators. Sometimes, and this happens with a lot of people, when we are wronged or we feel slighted, our objectivity kind of goes to the wayside. And we can begin to assess the gravity of an offense based on how we feel rather than maybe how severe it objectively was. I feel like this was a very grave offense and therefore I can end up calling for restitution or uh, vengeance that is you know, exceeds the crime leaps and bounds. Good kind of comical example of this. In uh, 2018, there was a Florida couple who felt that they were wronged by McDonald's. Um, They ordered a quarter pounder without cheese, which they received, but they were charged the same price as a quarter pounder with cheese. And the difference there is about 30 cents. But apparently the emotional trauma that they experienced at this 30 cent charge was so horrendous that they ended up suing McDonald's for $5 million in damages. Now obviously it's a frivolous lawsuit, the judge threw that out almost immediately. But it just kind of illustrates in extreme measures how we sometimes look at an offense and go, this was such a heinous act and we can easily demand a greater restitution than it actually calls for. Maybe a more relatable and realistic example, you see this in the, the schoolyard at times, kids start to insult each other, you know, makes fun of one kid, your mom is so dumb, blah, 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 and the other kid is so hurt and so offended, he just hauls off and socks the other kid, right? Now, there was an offense, there was hurt, but it's not the same as hitting somebody in the face with your fist. Those words might hurt, but they're never going to put somebody in a hospital. Those words might sting, but they're never going to cause physical damage. Those words might sting, but it's not against the law like assault is, right? So there was restitution, but it's not proportionate. This law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, it was meant to protect people from experiencing too much justice, we might say. So it's a good law, and at the heart of it, God recognizes our human tendency to seek revenge, to get even, to feel that we need some sort of payment for the wrongs we have suffered. And sometimes we demand a little too much. That was the law. But listen to what Jesus says. He recognizes that tendency within us, but he he kind of ups the ante a little bit. He says, you've heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person or an evildoer. And we need to understand what that word resist means. Because sometimes this passage is used to explain that, you know, we're just supposed to be complete and total pacifists in all things and get stepped on and walked over and not defend ourselves and blah, blah, blah. That's not what Jesus is saying here. That word resist, if we were to look at it in classical Greek, it was used mostly in a military context. And it was a word that usually meant to take a firm stand in opposition, primarily against your enemy. And if we look at it in the context of what Jesus said about the law, about revenge and and all that, what we seem to be saying is not so much Jesus saying, you just need to be a doormat that everybody walks over, so much as how we view other people. Do not look at people as enemies. Do not oppose somebody as an enemy. Don't look at that person, even that person that has harmed you or wounded you or offended you. Do not view them as an enemy. Now that kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. If I'm not looking at this person who hurt my feelings or has offended me or has wounded me as somebody who I am opposed to, well, what are they to me? That's an important question that needs to be answered. 
If they're not my enemy, well, then how am I supposed to interact with them? What's my treatment of them going to be? You see, this is a frame of mind that Jesus is sort of suggesting here. It's a frame of mind that kind of opens the door to forgiveness and allows us to maybe take a step through. And it kind of answers one of our questions. Do I need to forgive people? Should I even try to make reconciliation? Well, if people aren't my enemies, what business do I have trying to hold a grudge against them or keep them at arm's length? If people really aren't my enemies, well, why shouldn't I try to make good terms with them? The Apostle Paul, he says, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with everyone. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to want to be at peace with you, but as far as it depends upon you, your actions, yeah, you need to try to reconcile. That's who we are. We are people of reconciliation. We were reconciled to God through the work of Jesus. We are forgiven of sin because of what he did. It makes sense that we should embody that in the rest of our lives and relationships as well. But how do we do that exactly? That's the tricky part. How, how do we forgive people? For some of us, we are naturally gifted with a gracious heart, and forgiveness is something that comes very easily and naturally. For others of us, forgiveness is not quite so simple, especially when there are deep hurts. It takes a big kind of forgiveness, a big kind of action to make that happen, that reconciliation even possible. So how do we do it? If we look at the rest of what Jesus says, he has several scenarios, hypothetical scenarios that he lays out for us. But in each of them, there's kind of an action step that helps us work towards forgiveness, that changes us a little bit. It deals with our head, our heart, and our hands, and it kind of reframes how we view other people a little bit. As we look at this first one, what we're going to see is that forgiveness has something to do with trusting God and primarily trusting His justice. It begins by trusting God and His justice. So let's take a look back at verse 39. Let's see what Jesus had to say. This is the second half there. He says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So this is obviously where the phrase, turn the other cheek, comes from. And I gotta admit, I've heard that said many, many times in my life. Nobody's ever taken the time to like thoroughly explain what that means exactly. It's kind of just up for interpretation. Somebody wrongs you and just, well, just turn the other cheek. Okay? Like, so what does that mean exactly? Jesus chose his words pretty carefully here. And he's painting a specific kind of scenario. And you and I, when we hear that, maybe the thing that jumps out at us is somebody just got slapped in the face, right? The physical aspect of it probably strikes us because according to our laws in this land, that is assault. Somebody just got smacked upside the head. That's not good. And that certainly would have stood out in a Jewish context. But in the first century, there's something else that probably jumped off or jumped out at people even more than the physicality of it all. If I'm squaring up to somebody to smack them in the right side of the face, and by the way, I just so I have my ADD brain here, have you seen that slap boxing before? Anybody seen that YouTube video? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind here, but just visualize that for a moment. So you're squaring up to slap somebody, and you want to get their right cheek, right? It's really on this side. You either got to slap them one of two ways. Either you use the left hand, which was kind of problematic, because the left hand throughout the Bible is not consistently, but oftentimes has negative connotations attached to it. And in the Middle Eastern world, even today, our Muslim friends would call this the dirty hand. Because this is the hand that you would use to wipe yourself after number two. I'm not trying to be funny, it's just the way it is. It's very offensive to try to shake with the left hand. There's a lot of negative connotations to the left hand. If you're smacking somebody in the face with that hand, that's pretty insulting, Right? Especially if that holds true, right? The alternative is you use the right hand, but you backhand them across the right side of the face. That's just as insulting. That's not how you treat equals. That's how you treat inferiors. That's how Roman soldiers would oftentimes abuse and mistreat Jewish citizens because we are not equals and you need to know it. In either case, it's not just the physical act here that is problematic. There is a grave insult and a huge disrespect being given to this other person. Now, this is a lot to take in. So you put yourself in that scenario. And let's just take the, the physicality out of it. Somebody gravely insults you and, and just levies a great deal of disrespect at you. What is your natural tendency going to be? Something up here is going to start to bubble up, right? And you're going to have this need, this desire, this want to retaliate in some way. Tit for tat, insult for insult, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It's a natural human reaction, you know? 
We just have this need to lash out or to get back. But what happens in that scenario? Let's say somebody insults you. Do you then insult them back and then they say, okay, we both had a turn, fair's fair, let's go our separate ways. I've never seen that happen in my life. No, even though we may have gotten even, it doesn't mean the score is settled. This other person, this perpetrator, they're going to come back for round two. And are you going to take that sitting down? Oh, heck no, you're not. You've got your own insult that you're going to levy back at them. And this cycle is just going to continue because that's what happens when pride and ego get involved. Getting even will never even the score. And that's why it's kind of brilliant what Jesus says here. Turn the other cheek. Now, they may strike that one also. Just turn the other cheek. End it. Break the chain. You have successfully undone this conflict. It's over. But we might hear that and go, wait a minute. If I turn the other cheek, they might slap me on that one too. If I don't say anything, they have wronged me or they have insulted me and they're going to get away with it. Will they? Here's the thing, guys. We claim to believe in a God who sees all things, who knows all things, who perceives even the deep recesses and motivations of our heart even clearer than we sometimes can. And we claim to believe in a God who judges and judges justly, a God before whom all things will be laid bare and all people will stand account. That's the God we claim to believe in. Do we really believe That he's going to overlook injustice. That he is going to overlook some slight. That he's going to overlook some offense and say, you know what, that wasn't that big a deal. You're fine. Rub some dirt on it. Go on with your life. Or do we believe what he says? Do not seek revenge. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. This is the God we believe in. A God of justice. This is the God that Jesus believed in, which is why he even says this stuff to begin with. And these aren't just words, by the way. This is how he actually lived. We're reminded of that very poignant example, 1 Peter 2, verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus suffered more injustice and insult than I think you and I can probably comprehend. Though he was completely innocent, he was convicted, he was found guilty of crimes he didn't commit, he suffered an execution his life didn't merit, he was insulted and mocked and jeered for things he did not do as he suffered and died, and he bore the iniquity and the sin of mankind, sin he did not commit. And yet through all of that, He doesn't insult, he doesn't mock, he doesn't belittle, he doesn't retaliate. He entrusted himself to the God who sees all things and judges justly, the same God that you and I say we believe in. And this wasn't because of some superhuman ability that he had. No, he was Jesus, it was different. He was still a human being. The reason Jesus could do this is because what that last line said, he entrusted himself. He had faith, essentially, in this God and believed that he was who he claimed to be. And Jesus was proved right. Three days later, his body was raised back from the life, vindicated, shown for all mankind. He really is who he claimed to be. He really was the innocent and chosen one, and everybody better make amends. We're going to celebrate that vindication in a few weeks in Easter. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So here's where this is going. This is the God we claim to believe in. Jesus has shown us that he is worth trusting. So will we? Will we lower ourselves? Will we debase ourselves and exchange insult for insult? Will we seek retaliation? Will we seek to take justice into our own hands because we don't trust that God really will settle all things when it's all said and done? Or will we entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly? Will we end the cycle of vengeance and retaliation and tit for tat and eye for eye? Because this person in front of us, remember, is not our enemy. This person who wrongs us or offends us or hurts us, they're not our enemy. You know what they are? There's somebody in need of grace, just like you and me. 
That kind of changes the way we see people, doesn't it? That frame of mind, this is not my enemy, and I trust that God will make sure all things are squared away when it's all said and done. That sort of opens the door for us to look at people differently. If I don't have to worry about getting revenge and taking justice into my own hands, if I know God's handled that, it kind of frees me up to do life a little differently. But the question is, what exactly? How am I supposed to see this person in front of me if they're not my enemy? That's kind of where this next scenario comes into play. Jesus keeps talking a little bit, and in this case, he seems to be saying that forgiveness demands that we prioritize people. Now, we've talked about this already a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter 5, and here it is again showing back up. This seems to be a pretty big theme for Jesus. Forgiveness demands that we prioritize people. Let's look at this scenario that he paints for us. This is verse 40. He says, And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat or your cloak as well. Now, presumably, if somebody wants to sue you, they've got a legitimate claim against you. Or at least they feel they have a legitimate claim. It may be baseless, but they feel that they've been wronged. And so there is this perceived slight. There is that relational tension between the two of you. This isn't talking about frivolous stuff or evildoers or like that couple in Florida or whatever. Somebody feels like there's beef between you. What Jesus is saying here is there's this temptation for us to maybe lawyer up, for us to go on the defensive, to treat this person as if they're an adversary, but instead, here's what, we're, what we ought to do. Pursue peace with them, make amends with them. In fact, be incredibly generous in the way that you seek to make amends and repair that relationship. Clothing in the ancient world was not cheap. I know we can go to the Dollar General and we can buy a t-shirt for like five, ten bucks, whatever, but most people in the ancient world had like one set of clothes if you were real fancy, you might have two, but like clothing was expensive. So if you're going to give somebody your shirt, that's not just literal. You have metaphorically lost your shirt as well. That's expensive. But Jesus goes even beyond this. He says, give them your coat, your cloak as well. And that's just insane because the cloak was by far the most costly and useful item that 99% of people owned. Not only was it something that kept you warm, but if you were poor, that was your bedding. That was your pillow. That was shelter if you lived outside. That's how you, uh, it was a satchel that you could wrap up your stuff and carry it in if it was too heavy. This was a very versatile, useful, costly item. And Jesus is saying, hey, go give them your cloak also. And we might look at that and say, that's an insane value proposition. And Jesus says, you're right. We are vastly undervaluing people and the significance of our relationships. You see, we have this tendency in our culture, because we're a rather materialistic culture, to undervalue people and overvalue things. Property, possessions, stuff. That tends to be the trap that we fall into. Jesus is kind of flipping that on its head here and really trying to give us a different viewpoint about the significance of people and relationships in our lives. We have these sayings in our culture. We use them a lot in the church. Can't take it with you, right? You ever thought that or said that? It's beautiful, I love it, it's nice, but you can't take it with you, right? Or it's not said so much, it's all just going to turn to ash anyway, kind of referring to Revelation. Things are temporary, we recognize that. I've noticed we don't have nearly as many statements to talk about the eternality of other things, like relationships. You can't take that stuff with you, but you actually can take relationships with you. It's not like when we all go to heaven, our brains are going to be reset to zero, and we're not going to have any idea who anybody is. We are forever people right now. Jesus talks about it in John. He's talking to Martha. He says, he who believes in me will live even though they die, and the one who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's saying, basically, if you believe in Jesus, you, you are alive, and that life that you have persists on and on and on and on, even past the grave. Eternity doesn't start when you die. Eternity starts when you say yes to Jesus and you become a forever kind of person. That means the relationships that you have in the body of believers, these are forever. And forever is a really long time to live in tension and friction and turbulence. If you think a 10-hour trip to Louisiana is a long time, you just wait till heaven. It's a long, long time to be at odds with somebody. And we might playfully think to ourselves, well, heaven's a big place, you know, I'll just avoid them. No, you won't. It's not that big. You got eternity to accidentally bump into one another. How do you think that conversation is going to go? And you know what? God's pretty funny. He's probably going to give you an apartment right next to that person. You're going to have to deal with him. And it's a silly way to think about it, but there's a point here. 
we are going to live eternally with the body of believers. Don't you think it's pretty important that we make sure these relationships are in good standing? If these go on and on and on and persist forever, don't you think it makes more sense to make peace with our neighbors? Which, by the way, is talking about the body of believers. Don't you think it makes sense to be at peace with them? Because this other stuff that we value so much, these things that we get upset about or might be the cause of our friction, they're temporary. But our relationships are forever. It's a different way of thinking about things, isn't it? And Jesus is really challenging us here, not just to look at things with our head, but to look at our heart and develop a priority for people. Because if we can put that right value on people, forgiveness becomes a little bit easier. Reconciliation becomes a little more significant and important. Because we're not going to have forever to put things right. So if we want to learn to forgive, here's one step. Don't view people as enemies. Remember that God is the judge. He'll take care of all that stuff. You just focus on people and the importance of relationships. And here's a third bit of advice. This one's a bit of an action step too. It moves to our hands. Forgiveness oftentimes means that we need to seek to serve people. Forgiveness becomes easier when we seek to serve others, especially those against whom we are embittered. And that is hard. That's really challenging. And Jesus knew full well what he was saying. He is speaking in a first century Jewish context. And in the first century Jewish world, pretty much everybody, unless you were making money off of it, pretty much everybody hated the Roman Empire. And they had good reason to. Because Rome was this oppressor who had come in and stripped them of their freedoms and their rights. Rome was who was taxing them into poverty. Rome was who, who was moving their icons and their iconography into their world. And it was offensive to their God, to their law, to their heritage, to their sensibilities. Rome was the enemy. And they had every reason to be bitter about it. And there was no harsher reminder of this than when a Roman soldier patrolling the streets of your neighborhood would come up to you and conscript you, conscript you into mandatory service, saying, I want you to carry my 120-pound pack for the next mile, which is what they're legally allowed to do. If you refuse, you either get one of these or you go to jail. That's the context that Jesus is speaking to, and here's what he has to say to people. Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile... Go with them two miles. Who do you think he's talking about there? It's the scenario in which Jewish people were forced to serve their oppressors and the people they were embittered against. And Jesus says, go the extra mile, you might say. That's where the phrase comes from. But in this context, he isn't saying put in the extra effort. He is saying serve willingly, particularly those people you are embittered by. Here's the thing. That's probably the last thing we want to do when we're hurt. It's probably the last thing we want to do whenever we're at odds with somebody. But if we can tamp down our pride and our ego and willingly care for the needs of somebody else, those people that we are opposed to, it is a powerfully transformative experience. In 2014, uh, the Islamic State, ISIS, they overran and took over the city of Fallujah. And for two years, they were a plague on that city. A lot of people died. Homes and businesses were destroyed. Articles of historical and artistic significance were destroyed. They were locusts. In 2016, the Iraqi military drove them out of the city and took many ISIS soldiers as prisoners. They held them in compounds on the outskirts of the city, several different locations. And most of them looked like pretty standard military compounds. Prisoners, jumpsuits, hands bound, living in tight quarters, cells, and so on. But at one of these compounds, things look just a little different. There's this humanitarian organization called the Proactive Love Coalition that came in and was distributing food and water to these ISIS soldiers, these prisoners. And because they were in jumpsuits, they were all sitting down, their hands were bound, they couldn't really like eat a lot. So these aid workers are coming by and putting food in their mouths, taking bottles of water, and helping them drink, serving these people. And among these aid workers was a man named Sadiq. And Sadiq was going through the, the line, giving food and water to these prisoners, and he got to a face that he recognized. He had to think for just a second, not a whole lot more, 
because it's a pretty traumatic memory. This man was filmed in an ISIS propaganda video executing, brutally killing another man who happened to be Sadiq's best friend. And Sadiq is looking at this man, and there's every opportunity to see him as an enemy, and every opportunity for bitterness to seethe, and for retribution and justice to be achieved. He could have just passed over him. You don't get food and water today. He could have given him one of these as he walked by because guards aren't going to care. A lot of opportunities here. So Sadiq looked this man in the eye and he said, you killed my friend. But I have come to feed you. And he put food in this prisoner's mouth. And he cradled his hand, his head in his hand and he poured water into his mouth. He blessed him, and he moved on to the next prisoner and left this prisoner weeping. Somebody who was beginning to come to terms with his actions and what he had done. It's so tempting to seek some sort of retribution, to retaliate eye for eye, tooth for tooth, But in refusing to resist, to see somebody who has offended us as an enemy, even to serve them, is a powerfully transformative experience, not just for us, but for them as well. And I'm convinced that the power of these moments comes because we are imitating Jesus himself. He stepped out of heaven, put on flesh, made his dwelling among us, lived a mortal life, healed our wounds, washed the feet of his friends, and ultimately would die on a cross bearing our burdens and our sins. Not just one mile, not two miles, the way that he said, but separating us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. So far has God removed our transgressions. He served us, though in our sin we were in opposition against him. And because of that act, we were changed. We were saved. And we were forgiven. We were given new hearts and a new opportunity of life. We were given the Spirit of God. We are fundamentally different now because He served. And He lays before us this opportunity to do likewise. It is a powerfully transformative experience when we genuinely care for the needs of other people, even those opposed to us. And by the way, do you know what another name for genuinely caring about someone else's needs is? What's another word for that? Love. It's an opportunity to love our enemies. Is what we're going to talk about next week, actually. It's almost as if Jesus has this sermon planned out. Forgiveness is hard. Sometimes it's easy. And, and you know what? Praise God if forgiveness comes easy to you. But for a lot of us, it takes a little work. It starts here. Remembering that these are not enemies. These are people in need of grace. And I trust that God is a just judge, and he will take care of this. That frees me up to view them a little differently, and to treat them a little differently. To remember that these people have tremendous value, and that this relationship, especially if it is among believers, this is an eternal thing. So let's take care of it. Let's prioritize people. And for an action component, sometimes that means I need to serve these people. I need to aid them. I need to help them. I need to love them. And it is going to be incredibly uncomfortable. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because we are dying to ourselves. And we are tamping down that pride and that ego. And there's that fleshly part of our hearts that says, don't do this. This is uncomfortable. And then there's that spirit of God that says, this is what you were called to. And this is what it means to walk in the shadow of Jesus. Forgiveness is hard. But it is so worthwhile. And we have somebody that didn't just call us to this impossible task. We have somebody that showed us what it looks like. Somebody that accomplished this kind of forgiveness and healed our relationship with the Heavenly Father. And he lays out this game plan for us to do likewise. And so I would encourage you this morning, as you were listening to this, you probably had a face or two pop in your head, even if it was just for a minute. Don't let that slip by. I would encourage you to prayerfully consider what it means to attempt to reconcile with this person. To forgive. I'm not saying you're going to be best friends and you're going to hang out on the weekends. 
But there needs to be some action because as Paul said, we were reminded, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Make peace. Be a peacemaker. That's what we're called to. That's the favor that we enjoy. And that's how we experience the life that Jesus is talking about and leads us down. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for forgiveness. We have experienced it. We have been the recipients of mercy and grace, of reconciliation. We've been healed through your service on the cross. We've been made new and given a new opportunity for a new life. And we, though once we're outsiders, have been brought into your family all because you loved us when we were opposed to you. Teach us how to do the same. Teach us how to see people not as enemies, but as people in need of grace. Even when we hurt. Teach us to prioritize people and relationships above all the things that shine and shimmer in this world. These temporary things that sometimes overshadow the eternal. And teach us to serve the way that we've been served. To starve our pride and our ego so that we can nourish the Spirit of God and His calling. Again, we thank you for the mercy that comes to the name of Jesus. And it's in that name that we pray. Amen.